the heart of the coastal empire, the members of Calvary Baptist Temple welcome you to our Sunday service. Our service is led by Senior Pastor Kenny Grant. Your love is a mountain beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery. How you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah. 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 I can feel it rising All the joy that's growing Deep inside of me Every time I see you All your goodness shines through I can feel this God song Rising up in me Hallelujah 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 Your love makes me sing Hallelujah Hallelujah Hallelujah, your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing. Your love makes me sing. can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King.
from singing your praise. How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I am loved by the King, and it Have a seat. Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to Calvary. My name is Tommy and I'm one of the pastors around here and we're so glad you've joined us today. Is it nice to feel a little fall in the air? Yeah, it's nice to feel the seasons changing and sometimes in life it's nice to feel that God's bringing you into a new season as well, isn't it? And I believe that's true for us here at Calvary too. God's always bringing us into a new season and doing some new things and, and uh, I feel that around here. And today... We're going to be beginning a new season by bringing a season to an end. And today we're going to wrap up our Family Fuel series. And so Pastor Kenny's going to come out and do that in just a few moments. But first, I want to draw your attention to your bulletin that you should have received when you came in. If you would, go ahead and grab the connection card that's inside there. It looks just like mine and the pen that we gave you when you came in. And if you don't mind, go ahead and begin filling out the front side of that card. And if you're a regular attender or a member here at Calvary, you can go ahead and fill out your name, your email address, any other information that may have changed. But if this is your first time with us, first of all, let me just say thank you for coming today. You're our honored guests, and we're excited that you've come. And we want you to enjoy yourself. We want you to have a positive experience. But more than anything, we want you to encounter the one true and living God today. And, uh, and that's why we're here, and we hope that's why you're here today. And I want to invite you to share as much information as you feel comfortable sharing on the front side of this card. And as you work your way down the card, if you'll check the box over here on the left-hand side that says first or second time guest, that'd be great. And then on your way down at the bottom, you'll see a question that says, how did you hear about Calvary? That's always helpful to us. We love to know how you found out about us. Maybe a friend or a family member's name who invited you, a coworker or a neighbor or just some random stranger. It may be a Google search or something on Facebook, who knows, but if you'll let us know how you found out about us, that's helpful. You know, one of the reasons we ask you to fill out this card every week is because when you fill out the front of this card, that's like your way of saying to God, hey, I'm gonna fill out the front of this thing because I believe you have a next step for me to take on the back. And so today I'm signing up and I'm saying, okay, God, whatever you have, I'm ready and I'm listening and I'm going to take that step. And so on the back of this card are several next steps that you may want to take today that God may burden your heart with. He may call you to take some next steps. And over here on the side, there are some that go along with today's sermon. There are some over here that are all about your personal walk with Christ. And then there are some that are all about serving, which is another place that God is stretching and growing many of us. And so I want to encourage you to pay close attention to what Pastor Kenny's sharing today. And most of all, what the Holy Spirit of God is saying to you today and be willing to take those next steps during the service and hang on to this and we'll turn these in as we worship through giving in the offering today. And so we'll continue worshiping right now. In fact, if you would, go ahead and bow your head and I'll pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for meeting us here. We know that when we come together, it's not just us. We are not just coming together to, to celebrate our own experiences or our own uh, wisdom or our own knowledge or whatever it is that we bring to the table because we know that that in and of itself is nothing. It's rubbish. But God, we're here to meet you. And we know that you've already met us here. So we give you this time. In fact, we lift it up to you. We lift up our very selves to you as an offering today. We, we thank you that you're in our midst. We pray that you would speak clearly to us today. Lord, as we worship you, as we, as we reflect as much of your greatness back to you as we possibly know how, we pray that that would be uh, an offering to you, that you would uh, receive that, and that you would speak to us and give us clear instructions as to what our next steps are to be, wherever we are in our journey with you. Whether we're here for the first time, or whether we've been here for years or decades, whether we are 
already following you and we just need to continue to grow and deepen that relationship or whether we're here today just checking it out and trying to figure out who you are. Lord, we know that you are faithful to meet us here wherever we are and to give us those steps. And so today I pray that you would speak clearly to each of us, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for what you're doing in our community and in our church. And we ask you to continue to work and speak clearly to each of us so that we all as a church can move forward. So we give you this time. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. All right, if you would, go ahead and stand up. We'll continue worshiping now. But if you would, go ahead and turn around and say hello to two or three people you haven't yet spoken to this morning, and we'll move on. Thank you. Although you can do that too. But now it can also read to you, show you timeless stories in a whole new way, or even help you share what you've learned with someone you know. Read, listen, watch, share. Now you can do all of that and more. Because now the Bible is an app. Download it for free at bible.com slash app. praise offering this morning. You know, Paul said that Jesus said unto him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that there's a lot of weakness in this old body of mine. And I think probably if you were honest with yourself, you'd say the same. But Christ said that through weakness, power is perfected if we'll just give him that you know he is enough to meet every need to meet every challenge that comes before us in life we just got to turn it over to him and let him take it all for us sing these words with us in christ is my reward all my devotion
Christ all that you need? If that's the case, then I want you to sing this next song, this part with me with all your heart. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back.
seated. Father, we're so grateful to be in your house this morning. We're so grateful that you are there to meet every need, no matter the trial, no matter the tribulation that we may face. We know that you're right there with us. Lord, we need you. We need you every hour. And we thank you that you're always there. In Jesus' name.
love my church because it feels like home. Right when I walk through the doors, I'm always receiving hugs or giving them. I love the church because this is where I married my beautiful wife. I love my church because of Brother Kenny's teaching. I love my church because its members are warm and welcoming. I absolutely love my church because of the lively worship and the sound teaching from the Word of God. I love this church because um, it really allows me to explore the Word of God. I love my church because I'm Pastor Pastor Grant who preaches the Word only. I love my church because of the family atmosphere. I love my church because it's deeply rooted in the community and all of its members seem like great ambassadors of Christ. I love my church because it feels like family. I love my church because everyone is so friendly and I love the biblical teaching. I love the people that's that's been, that's surrounding this um, this big family. I love my church because it's full of family and friends. I love my church because we have a heart to reach the city of Savannah for Jesus. And I love my church because they look kids like me. Hey, it's all about family apparently. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, I hope you love your church. We'll be starting a series next week on uh, the church and your church and what your church needs from you and what you can expect from your church. All right, our children are free to go. And while they are, I'll ask you to take your Bibles and be finding the book of First Peter, chapter number 3. Today we close in a series on family fuel. We're talking about finishing strong, making love last. Now, Really, that's a misnomer right there in the title because the very nature of love is to last. And the idea of somehow making love last uh, gives a, some sort of a, an idea that love does not last. Well, the Bible says that love endureth all things. Biblical, scriptural, godly, God-given love last. Though other things may fall away, the thing that comes clear uh, through loud and clear in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 is that love, agape love, real love, sacrificial, transcendent, transformative, travailing love lasts. And one of the things that I've, uh, I've enjoyed watching as I've been the pastor of this church is to see people who are aged who have loved each other for years, for, for decades. And they, they love each other right to the very end, all the way to the grave. I've seen it. I, we have men here in our church who will their wives in. I think of Dale Lamb. I thought, think of Jack Crumley. Uh, I, men who I stood right beside and I've stood right beside them as the, the, their loved ones, their health began to fail. And there have been women who have loved their husbands all the way to the end. I think sometimes when we talk about making love last, I think we're talking about more than love. We're talking about romance. But, but the idea of love is that it always lasts. It endureth all things. And, and in our families, in our, in our homes, in our marriage relationship, there is a care and feeding that must be given to this so that at the end of the day, our marriages, our homes might be a ministry to the world. That the world through our marriage relationship, that the world through our family can give honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I want you to read with me now First Peter chapter number 3. Uh, beginning at verse number one, and we'll read down to verse number seven. Notice what it says. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation or the conduct or the lifestyle of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation, lifestyle, coupled with fear. Who's adorning, ladies? Let it not be that outward adorning of the plaiting of the hair and the wearing of gold and the putting on of apparel. He's not saying that there is anything wrong with these things, but he's saying there is a better way to dress up. But let it be the hidden 
person, the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. All right? Now, I want to tell you, there's, there's a way you can grow in beauty. And there's a way you can adorn yourself. But it is an inward adorning. There is an inward uh, beauty that, listen, doesn't fade away. Now, ladies, I want to just tell you, there's a new crop of beauties being born all the time. And you're not going to be able to compete with outward beauty. The idea is you're to give yourselves to beautifying yourselves in that part which is real, that part which does not fade away. That part, by the way, which the Bible says that God sees. Notice it says, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price or value. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. See? The women of the Old Testament, he's talking about these women that we read about and women whose lives we see played out in the Scripture. Sarah, of course, being one of them. They were in subjection uh, unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, live with them, abide with them according to knowledge in an understanding way. Right? All men need to know something about all women in general, but every man needs to know something about his woman specifically. Dwell with them in an understanding way, according to knowledge, giving honor unto them, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, that idea of weak, weaker vessels certainly does not uh, imply, and don't you infer, that it means inferior. It is not. It, it carries the idea of delicate, uh, just as silk is weaker or more delicate than denim. But certainly denim is not more valuable than silk. And so our wives are more delicate. It's like the difference between Tupperware and crystal, right? And so he says that you are to give honor unto them as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, I want to just talk to you about this business of the care and feeding of our marriages and our, our homes, because as I said, whether you are married, a spouse, or a single person, or just a Christian in this place this morning, what's good for one is good for all. And we could give, we, there's, there's something for all of us to learn and each of us to learn from the Word of God. Every time we open the Bible, God opens His mouth and He has something to say to all of us. And so single people don't take the day off. This is for you. Now, how do we make it through in our marriage relationships? I think I told you the story about this a young man sitting in an airport one day and he saw a flight that had, uh, had flown in from Paris and it landed there in the airport. And, and there's this man and this woman who got off the plane and they were obviously elderly people and they were kissing one another and hugging one another and loving one another. And this man just admired that. He went up to the old man and says, excuse me, sir, how old are you? He says, I'm 90 years old. He says, well, how old is your wife? Well, she's 85. He says, how long have you all been married? He says, we've been married 70 years. What? 70 years? How in the world have you all lasted for 70 years? And I see such affection and such love. How have you all kept it going like that? He said, well, let me tell you, son. He says, and this is a secret. He said, I'm going to tell you. He said, when we first got married on the honeymoon, I took my sweetheart to Europe. The young fellow said, well, you take her there every year? He says, no, I just went back and got her. Now, you know, if it's, you know, it could be easy to be married and then move to different continents. You know what I'm saying? Well, the idea, though, is how do we live together? How do we share life together? This grace of life. How do we walk together? You know what I'm finding out in marriage? The problem many times, as I've said before, is not so much that people are not in love. And it's not that, that maybe even as Christians we're not 
in Christ. The problem is we're not in step. We haven't learned to walk in step. We haven't learned the things that are absolutely positively necessary for us to live together and for us, as Peter says in chapter number 3, verse number 7, to be heirs together, joint heirs of all that God intends for us to enjoy as a husband, as a wife, as a family. And so let me just give you some of these things. And I believe, interestingly enough, that it begins to tell us how to do that beginning in the next few verses, beginning at verse number eight. I just want to give you uh, these things, so write very, very quickly here now. Number one, the principle of marriage commitment. I believe that's what we have to have. And it's, by the way, look this way, that's implied. Now, now watch this. We have to have we have to enter into marriage the way God intends for us to enter into marriage. We need to be inside of our marriage what God intends for us to be inside of our marriage. And that is that we are to have an absolute, unabashed, unashamed, undeterred commitment to the marriage relationship. Right? He says, uh, therefore what God has put us uh, together, let no man put asunder. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That speaks of the permanence of the marriage relationship. Now, let me say this to you, that the way we are committed to our marriages is first and foremost by being absolutely committed to Jesus. Jesus said this in Luke chapter number 14. You can look at it in verses 25 through 20, 26, 27. Jesus says, listen, except you. Now, this is going to sound a little strange, but this is what Jesus says. Except you, a man, a woman, a person, a Christian, except you love me more. He went on to, he said, except you hate <laughs> father, mother, wife daughters and sons, sisters and brothers, yea, your own selves, you cannot be my disciples. Didn't say you can't be saved, but he's saying true discipleship, true discipleship is based on absolute commitment to Jesus over and above everything and everyone. Now you say, well, preacher, that seems to go against what you're saying. I mean, I, am I to leave father and mother? Am I to hate them? Now, the word hate is a word that speaks of comparisons. Jesus doesn't want us to hate our mother and father in the sense that we might think. But the idea is there is a choice here. There is a preference here. I choose Jesus over every thing and everyone else. And it is precisely my commitment to him that gives me what I need to be committed to what he has given into my life. I cannot presume to go and be a committed husband as I ought to be until and unless I am first committed to Jesus the way I'm supposed to, because that is what gives me the wherewithal to carry it out. And he is not just talking, I want you to hear me, he's not just talking about marriage in this passage. In chapter number two, he's talking about as, as, as the people of God, how we're to live and we're to have an attitude, watch this, because of our total commitment to Jesus to where we live in submission, whether we're talking about a godless government Look at what he says in verse number 13, in chapter number 2. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. See, because you're committed to Jesus, you can live in the proper kind of submission to the government, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto, uh, or as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. In other words, he's saying, hey, listen, even if you're living in a government that is not to your absolute liking, Someone is elected that you did not vote for. You don't want to be your president, your governor, your senator. The Bible says there ought to be an attitude of submission uh, to the government because of your love 
for Jesus. And it is because of your commitment to Jesus that you can live in right relationship with your government. And then not only is that true for the municipality and for governments, but he says it's true in the marketplace. It's true where you go to work. He says, listen, that in chapter number two, we're still in chapter number two. Look at what he says down at verse number 18. Servants, be subject, subject to your masters with all fear. Now, in our vernacular, the way we talk about it is employees live in right relationship. Be in subjection to your bosses, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the harsh. You know what makes you a better employee? You know what makes you a more committed employee to the job and to the task at hand on your job? Being a good Christian. It is your commitment to Jesus Christ that gives you the ability to live in right relationship with the government. And whether it's a godless government or not, live in right relationship to a bad boss. And then he goes on to say, likewise, wives, even if you have a husband who is not a believer... Even if you have a husband who is not an ideal husband. Because of your commitment to Jesus, live in subjection to him. That does not mean make yourself some sort of a, uh, you know, it, the idea is not you don't have a mind and that you're mindless. And that you allow him to keep you from obeying God. No, the idea is man must obey God rather than men. But the idea is for the Christian woman is that the way we honor the Lord in our marriages is that we understand that God has given to the man the mantle of leadership. And though he may not be an ideal leader, you are to bring yourself in your attitude, in your spirit, in your heart, in submission to him. And allow God, the one to whom you have committed all things, to fight on your behalf. To do the work that you cannot possibly do in his life. And the Bible says the same thing for a husband. Husbands, love your wives. Love them. Be what you're supposed to be. If you're committed to Jesus... She may not be ideal, it may not be perfect, but you commit yourself to Jesus and being committed to him can give you, that will give you what you need to be committed to your marriage relationship. So it starts first and foremost with a principle, the principle of marriage commitment and implicit in that is our commitment to Jesus, all right? Now, listen, I don't know who I'm talking to today. I don't know where you are in your marriage relationship. Uh, People are today so prone to throw in the towel. In fact, we walk around with the last straw in our front pocket, you know. That's the last straw. We're ready to play it at every turn. I've said it before, but you can break down and quit. Just become emotionally uninvolved right in the marriage. You can break out and run. That is, you can go to greener pastures. If you don't realize that it's really artificial turf, right? Or you can break through and win. And God's intent is that we break through and win. Not so we can glory in the success of our marriage, but so that Jesus Christ might be glorified in our lives. Amen? And so that he might receive the honor. And be careful now whenever, if ever, somebody... uh notices the fact that you have a wonderful family, a wonderful marriage, a wonderful relationship, be sure to give God the glory. Be sure to pass the honor on to Jesus. Amen. I am what I am by the grace of God. And were it not for the word of God doing his work and the spirit of God doing his work in me, I could not be a husband that I'm supposed to be. I could not be a wife. I'm supposed to give God the glory. Let him be glorified by your relationship. So I'll talk about the principle of marriage commitment. But also implicit in this is the principle of marital confidentiality. Write that down. Marital confidentiality. Marriage at the end of the day is between a man and a woman and their God. Now, he talks to him. Now watch this. In this passage, he talks to a wife and he talks to a husband. He says nothing to mother-in-laws, her mother's-in-law, and fathers-in-law. He doesn't say a thing to the children. Can I say this to you? That, that husbands and wives, your marriage is to be your business. 
I have to say this because you can imagine as a pastor and uh, helping people along, being helpers of their joy, you see in marriage so often that marriage is treated almost just with an open door and everybody is inside of that marriage relationship. I've seen people who have very, very uh, hard time keeping other people out of their business. They invite people into their marriage and their marriage is crowded with everybody. Listen, at the end of the day, your marriage is between a husband and a wife. Can I tell you this? Your children ought to be able to enjoy that wonderful relationship, but don't bring them into the middle, into the center of your marriage. And I'm talking about this for a reason. I see this. Wherever, it's open season. Everybody is there. Everybody has to know everything, every twist, every turn that goes on in the marriage. Don't do that. It is enough that the Lord knows. Talk to God. Talk to each other. Don't bring everybody in. Now, I'm not preaching against having people who will love you and help you. In fact, that's my job. I get in sometime, try to help, and then step out. But I just, I, it's so crowded in some of them because the daughter say this, the son say this, my mom say this, my dad, and everybody is in the middle. Be careful about who you let in the middle. Be careful about who you show your blood to because people will show your blood to other people, by the way. Wives, your husbands may not be what he ought to be. Maybe he said, he said something. Maybe he's done something. Could you go to the Lord with that? Don't go to your mama. <laughs> your mama loves you. She's going to be looking out for you. And when mister comes back with a box of chocolate and you're ready to move on down the road, right? You ready to move away from that offense, you ought to, mama ain't ready to go. Mama's going to hold it against him. Because cause he did that. He said that to my baby. Husbands, don't go telling your mama, oh God. You know what most mother-in-law problems are? Two women in love with the same man. Mama and wife. Don't go tell your mama, my wife didn't do this or my wife said this. Don't do that. You're not going to be able to dig out of that stuff. And I know people today who are upset because everybody's in here, but they let them in. It's between a husband and a wife. Remember that, all right? This principle of marital confidentiality. The principle of mindful compassion, verse number eight. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful. That word literally means tender hearted and merciful and uh, be humble. This is, you know what this is? Verse number eight is absolutely the opposite of selfishness. You want to know what deals a deadly blow to happiness in a marriage or happiness in a home? Selfishness. Enemy, public enemy number one. Selfishness will absolutely kill a marriage. The Bible says right here, that I, I, we're to have the same mind. You know what he's saying? There are five things he says. There needs to be harmony, sympathy, affinity, mercy, and humility. None of those are selfish words. Well, we learn how to yield the right of way. And we have Sympathy for one another. Remember what family means? F-A-M-I-L-Y. Say it with me. Forget about me. I love you. When I learn how to yield the right of way and I have mindful compassion. He is not perfect, ladies. She is not perfect, sir. 
but we live in harmony because we share sympathy and an affinity. The Bible talks about love as brethren. Just being better Christians will make us better husbands and better wives. Just being better Christians. Being tender hearted and humble. Only by pride comes contention. Every disagreement that you have could be lessened. It may be a legitimate disagreement, but it can be lessened if pride were not such an issue in our lives. An unwillingness to yield the right of way. Then there's a principle of mature consideration. Verse number nine, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. I call this ma mature consideration. You know why? Because we have to grow up. You know, this is not tit for tat. Rendering evil for evil. Railing for railings. I remember when Shirley and I decided years ago that we would not go back word for word, especially in front of people. Now, I, <laughs> I, I know some of you are thinking, duh, but, but you'd be amazed how people do that. You, you with couples sometimes, and it's got, it's one-upsmanship. This one's got to have the last word. It's almost like they're performing for people who are there. And, and, uh, and nobody is willing to just crank it down. It's just boop, 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 boop. And before long, there's an insult, and then another insult, and another insult. And it's embarrassing. So we just decided we'll just do that in private, thank you. <laughs> no, that we wouldn't do it at all. And, uh, and monitor your words. Throw out some words. Throw them out. Words like st stupid, dumb. Throw that out. Don't be like little kids in the romper room that can't yield, can't. In fact, in, in 1 Peter chapter number 2, one of these says in verse number 2, he says, Hey, you desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. He's saying, Hey, folks, grow up. You need to grow up. But it doesn't always have to be your way. And you don't always have to have the last word. It's okay. An attitude of submission and meekness is a sign of maturity. Did you know that? Submission and, and meekness, just learning how to yield the right of way, not having to cut back. That's an attitude that, that reflects something has happened in my life. God is maturing me. I don't even have to argue back. I, I heard an example of this. This blind man tapping along, coming into this office. He's tapping along with his cane, and he stepped on the toe of a fellow who was sitting there who was talking, and he stepped on his toe, and he turned around and pushed the blind man. And he stumbled back, and the man said, Hey, man, you stepped on my toe. You know what this blind man said? Here's what he said. He said, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't see you. Now, now listen, he didn't say, hey, what are you push me for? I'm blind. And then take that white cane and whack him across the head. That'd been, he'd been, that'd been understandable. But you know what he said? I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Just the attitude where I, I can, I can give. I don't do that well. I want to do it better. You know what? It reflects, it reflects maturity in my life where I don't have to render evil for evil. I don't have to one-up you. I don't have to give insult for insult. The principle, not only that, but the principle of meaningful communication. Look at what he says in verse number 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. 
Hey, folk, Ephesians 4, if you don't know these verses, turn to Ephesians 4, highlight them in your Bible. Ephesians 4, verse number 29 says this, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. That is, your talk can tear down or build up that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Highlight that in your Bible. Hide those words in your hearts that you might not sin against God in this regard. That, oh God, guard my lips, guard my teeth, guard my tongue, guard my voice, that no evil communication proceeds out of my mouth, but rather that which is good to build up, to edify, rather than to tear down. And we have to be careful about that. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Is your speech at home always with grace? Seasoned with salt, see, that ye may know how to answer every man. You want to have a happy home? You want to see good days in your home? Learn to refrain your tongue from evil speak, from harsh talk, from insulting words, from nagging and complaining. You all see that Geico commercial where it's just what you do? You know, it's just what you do. If your husband's wife, you argue about direction. It's just, you remember that Tarzan? Tarzan is on that commercial. And that is Jane giving it to him in his ear the whole time. You, you, anybody? Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody? And here's, here's Tarzan. Tarzan, me Tarzan. Me know where you're going. Or you don't know where you're going. Ask the chimpanzee. You know, chimpanzee, I don't know. You know? And then at the end of the commercial, Tarzan trying to get his Tarzan yell on. Oh, 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 do you have to do that right in my ear? That's Jane. I'm like, get off my vine. You know what? You know what honors the Lord, the Bible says, ladies? A meek and quiet spirit. Now that doesn't mean you're like a little church mouse. It didn't say meek and quiet mouth. Meek and quiet spirit. I mean, I know ladies who have loud voices. I know ladies who laugh loud when something's funny. They cry out, they emote, they, they speak, they, they, but, but their, but their spirits are meek and quiet. The spirit. That honors the Lord. You know what honors the Lord? A husband who can yield the right of way and consider the fact that his wife is more delicate than him. That, that honors the Lord. And so when our words come out of our mouths and we live in a way where we are tearing down rather than building up, you can expect that our marriages will be in disrepair. You do have the right to remain silent. The power of death and life is in fact in the tongue. There are things that I wish I could take back as a husband, as a, as a father with my children. An old Marine Corps drill instructor barks out commands in a matter of fact sort of a way. As I, I watch my son sometimes with his family, he doesn't have that same edge. I admire that in him, that same ramrod kind of a Thing. I admire that in my son. He doesn't have that, you know, I, I wish I could have that a little bit more. But you know what? The truth of the matter is I can and I must. And you can and you must. Be careful, little tongue, what you say. Because words matter. And, and, and listen, these things ricochet for years around in the minds of people. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but wait a minute, words may break my heart. And so we have to be careful what you say. Wives, be careful with your language to your husbands. 
I'm just tell you something. You may not know this, but men are fragile. They really are fragile. Got that rough exterior, and you don't know it, but men are fragile. There's something that's called not an ecosystem, but the ego system. And you can knock it off balance. Be careful. Certainly, husbands, I'll be careful in how we talk. The Bible says, be not bitter against your wives. Don't be harsh in our tone, in our manner with our wives. Let me give you these last two. The principle of moral character. The Bible says in the first part of verse number 11, let him shun. Let him avoid evil and do good. Let him seek peace and and so the first part of that verse says that I am to stay away from that which is evil and ungodly. Now the Bible talks about the marriage relationship and how that we are to live as a husband and wife in a monogamous relationship. We have to be careful today because on every turn things seep into our marriage relationship. I've, I've heard stories, horror stories about people running into old high school friends, bumping into them on Facebook. And discussions happen out on Facebook. And before long, you've got something cooking that ought not ever been turned on because we don't have an attitude of guarding and roping off the marriage the way it ought to be. And so all sorts of evil and all sorts of immorality and all sorts of things. Listen, that's detrimental to my home. It's def detrimental to my life. Guard against that. <laughs> and the last one is the principle of mutual cooperation. Verse number 11, the last part of that says, seek peace. In fact, pursue it. Right? Husbands and wives, we can get along better if we would seek the things that make for peace. So the Bible says in Romans chapter number 14, verse number 19, let us therefore follow after, pursue the things which make for peace. This is not passive, it's active. How can we agree? This is not passive, it's active. In fact, it's more than just active, it's aggressive. Be aggressive in, in making the peace. Pursue it. So our homes can be a battlement. It's built for our protection, not a battlefield. And I want to, some of us are young parents right now, and maybe you are having young uh, marriage, maybe you're having some issues in your marriage. Can I tell you how you act and how you respond to one another may well determine how your children will live and how far they'll go in this world. I'm just telling you, our homes is the launching pad for our children. And I do thank God, I really do thank God that Shirley and I have enjoyed and have been enjoying as heirs together the grace of life so that our, our children and your children will love, love, love to come home. Live in such a way where your kids and your grandkids will love to come home. Because this is not a battlefield. We're careful about what we say to one another and careful about what we say to each other. Hey, problems just like everybody else. Issues just like everybody else. But these are the strategies for staying in step. And you can be in step with God and with one another. We have listed there some things for you to commit to. Would you commit to, hey, here's, a, here's the passage. Would you commit to reading this passage? every? I've read this passage every day this week, two or three times. Just let the Word of God go through me, comb the kinks out of my head about my marriage, my life, my attitude. Commit to reading through this passage. Commit to pursuing those things that make for peace in your life. We can finish strong, and Jesus can be glorified through the ministry of our marriages and the ministry of our homes. It starts with a commitment to Jesus. Maybe I'm talking to somebody you've never trusted Jesus. You want to be a good husband. You want to be a good wife. You want to be a good son or a good daughter. You want to be a good 
more well-adjusted member of the family, it starts with Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we're thankful that you have given to us your word. You've not left us to grope around in the dark. You've given us your word. Tell us what to do. You've given us your Holy Spirit to be able to do it. And Lord, there are people in this place this morning, God, who've never trusted Christ as Savior, as Lord. I pray that by your Spirit, sweet Holy Spirit of God, do your work of bringing conviction upon that heart. That mom, that dad, that husband, that wife, that young person might see their need today for Jesus and might come. I pray, Lord, for husbands and wives and moms and dads and in our homes in general, where, Lord, things are not, things are not as they ought to be. Hadn't been for a long time. By your grace, move in each heart and each life. Give Holy Spirit's courage for us, each of us, to do today what we'll be glad we did. We ask it in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. You need to come to this altar, you come. Those of you who need to trust Christ as your Savior, would you come? You want to follow the Lord and believe his baptism, openly identifying with him, you come. Maybe you want to unite with the church just like this, you come. Whatever it is God has spoken in your heart about, what you do today, what you will be glad you did. As they lead us in song, our ministers will be up front. Why don't you come? My name is John Robertson. Uh, I've been going to Calvary for 11 years now. Um, I, I tell you what, I fell in love with Calvary, first of all, because of the people. They're just very friendly. You can get just in, as involved in Calvary as you want to be. Um, my wife and I happen to be involved with the choir. Uh, we love the music here. And of course, Kenny Grant is absolutely wonderful. He's, he's not only a good preacher that preaches the Word of God in a way that you can understand it, but he is a wonderful, wonderful pastor. You've been watching the worship service from Calvary Baptist Temple in beautiful Savannah, Georgia. You're invited to join us for our services located at 63rd and Waters Avenue. If we can be of any service to you, call us at 351-2288. We pray today's message has been a blessing to you. If you would like to support the ministry of Pastor Kenny Grant in Calvary Baptist Temple, our address is 4625 Waters Avenue, Savannah, Georgia, 31404. Copies of this service are available. Thank you, and join us next week for another inspiring message.